Hey, what's up, mediums? Welcome to another episode of Live here on Keystroke Medium. As always, I'm Josh Hayes here with my co-host, the man who pioneered fine dining with a spork, Scott Moon. And today we are excited to have best-selling author Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Uh, he's the author of Creepy Capital, Evasion, and the director of self-publishing and author re relations at Kobo Writing Life. Mark, welcome to the show. It's great to be on the show, Josh. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Your uh, your Amazon profile labels you as a writer of dark fiction in the Twilight Zone style. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you got into publishing? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, every time I went to commit some writing to paper, I ended up writing weird fiction. And I always uh, identified it as horror because it wasn't quite science-y enough to be science fiction. And there were not really many fantasy elements in it, except what you might call urban fantasy. And, and my stories were just strange fiction where weird, scary things happen. So the, um, the closest in feeling uh, to most of my fiction would be something you would typically see on that old classic Twilight Zone television program. And not as Amazon uh, tried to um, block me because I, I was keywording the word Twilight, which I don't. <laughs> my my readers and Twilight readers are not the same people. <laughs> They're not sparkly vampires. Exactly. <laughs> Twilight, just for the record, so we're all clear. Twilight Zone did come first, right? So, and we all uh, a few know. a few decades earlier. Yeah, it, it's yeah. also way better uh, than the vampire books. I, you know, it, Twilight Zone actually, if you look at it from a, a writing standpoint, is it's one of the most uh, brilliant shows writing wise when you look at plot and story and all that because they did a ton of stuff with i mean what 20 minutes an episode that they had yeah that's the beauty of it is and i mean and it also illustrates just how much more difficult it is sometimes to write really good short fiction than it is to write a full-length novel because with a full-length novel you can get into the characters you can really explore things in fiction sometimes you're doing that in as low as a thousand words you know you know six thousand words but Still, you've got to pack so much more into such a tight space, so every single word is is that much more precious. Right. Short fiction's hard. Well, we've been doing some short fiction writing and um, for some anthologies, and I'd forgotten. I hadn't written any for a while. I'd forgotten. Um, you're really on the clock when you're writing writing tight. Yeah, exactly. Um, otherwise, you just go on and on. Like I, I go on and on when I talk, so you know, writing a longer piece is that much easier because mm -hmm. I can just keep going. Right. Uh, with short fiction, like, whoop, I hit my maximum word count. I got to cut this now. And yeah. you're done. You can, in longer fiction, you can you can spend three or four chapters developing a character that everybody loves so you can kill them off and piss people off. <laughs> 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 or put them in danger, I should say. Just put them yeah. in danger, make people want to keep reading. About. Just killing people. That's what we do all day yeah. long. Just, just a big setup to ax them at the end of the story. So tell us a little. It's just good therapy. Yeah. Therapy. <laughs> yeah. I don't like Cathartic. you. Kill you. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Creepy Capital. Uh, I'm I'm interested. You because you did you say that was traditionally published? I can't remember if you said that. Yeah, yeah, I do. About half of my works are traditionally published, and the other half are self published. So okay. Creepy Capital is part of a series of books that I've been writing for Dundurn, which is it's funny. I was going to say they're a small Canadian publisher, but right now they're Canada's largest independent publisher. So okay. <laughs> tell all the mergers that have happened. Oh and, wow! And uh, they're true ghost stories, or uh, and, and and I'll hold up air quotes. Tales told as true. As John Robert <laughs> Colombo, who um, who's a sort of a mentor of mine, had described them as, meaning uh, I approach them with the believer's uh, mindset, and I write them in a journalistic way as much as I can, where I know that the people reading the stories are true believers, and I approach it with an open mind, and I share the stories that people uh, tell or, or that I, I find in research. Uh, so, for example, uh, my girlfriend and I were just in, in Portland on a haunted pub tour for the next book that we're working on, uh, Spirits mm -hmm. Untapped. And, you know, we, we approach them with an open mind and sense of fun and take pictures and believe everything. But we also approach it with a bit, bit of skepticism. Right. Uh, so we actually ask questions. We don't answer the questions. We ask questions that make you wonder. And we ask questions that make you wonder if it's not true. So mm -hmm. I like to leave the story out there for the believers have a good time. They enjoy themselves. But a skeptic can also approach it and go, ah, okay, I see. Uh, probably more, the books are more in line for those who believe in ghosts. Right. It's not, okay. you know, you don't find skeptics going, rushing to the to the paranormal section in a bookstore looking to looking to read all the great ghost stories. Right. right. So it's fiction, but written as it's real. 
No, no, it's actually it's nonfiction. It's in the nonfiction section. Oh, okay. Um, it is, um, you know, historical. So creepy capital was uh, the capital city of Canada is Ottawa. And okay. I, I've gone with alliteration. It's all ghost stories about the city of Ottawa. And, and because it's our nation's capital, there's lots of history there. So there's a nice blending of history and ghosts. My first book was Haunted Hamilton. Second one I co-authored was Spooky Sudbury. Sudbury's a small town in uh, northern Ontario where I grew mm -hmm. up. Hamilton's where I live now. Um, and then uh, Tomes of Terror, which was haunted bookstores and libraries. And I just returned back to the editor, Rhonda Parrish, and I co-wrote uh, Haunted Hospitals. So if you haven't figured out the pattern, alliteration <laughs> is a key brand, author branding that I use for this nonfiction series. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. That's so you talked cool. about doing some research and stuff. Um, how, so how do you come about these stories um, that you include or that you work on? Well, it's, there's usually some sort of genesis. So, you know, perhaps uh, I'll talk about the, the next one, which actually breaks the alliteration mold um, oh. because we couldn't, we, we just couldn't, you know, and, you know, a six hour car ride, we were talking about the different uh, terms and some of the terms that I could use are probably not appropriate. So we ended up not going with them <laughs> and I'm not going to go there, but um, we ended up going with, uh, we wanted to do spirits on tap because Liz and I are huge craft beer advocates we just that's what we do we like like to travel and go check out craft beer and we also like mm -hmm. the culture we like the people the place we like to sit at the bar talk to the local bartenders or talk to the brewmaster and hear their stories so we wanted to buy spirits on tap the the domain and and pitch that to the publisher and of course the domain was taken the dot com yeah. was taken the dot ca wasn't taken but who wants one of those uh so the dot <laughs> no one wants so, a ca <laughs> and her daughter came up and said well what about untapped Spirits Untapped. So we bought spiritsuntapped.com and we started blogging. And, and I guess the idea was, wow, we've heard enough stories of haunted places and just fun places. So the blog itself is going to be, or is, the spirit of a place. It doesn't have to be eerie or spooky. The fun, the, the, the good nature, the people, the stories. And then along the way, uh, so for example, last night we went to three different haunted uh, beer locations. So along the way, we're going to find places that are haunted restaurants or pubs or breweries or whatever and tell those stories in just the book. So the book will be all ghost stories. And then the other, uh, the other stories, are, are, which we're just, we can just keep writing forever because we love doing it. So mm -hmm. it kind of comes from an interest or a passion. You know, I was on the a haunted Hamilton ghost walks. I was inspired to write a book. I talked to them. I said, you guys should write a book. And I said, we don't have time, but we'll give you all our stories if you want to make write a book. And go. so cool. a lot of the research is, you know, conversations with people, uh, newspapers, and believe it or not, like the, I spend so much time in the library <clears throat> digging into the microfiche of the historical newspapers. Uh, it's, it's, wow, these libraries are, are quite amazing and fun to, to hang out in. Mm -hmm. So, uh, kind of uh, segueing into your fiction, how does, does your nonfiction, the, the love of ghost stories and, and that uh, kind of translate into your fiction or do you take it in a, a different direction there? Um, it's funny, I, I stumbled into nonfiction uh, in 2012, so not, not all that long ago when I did my first nonfiction piece because fiction was my passion. I am the world's biggest chicken and I guess every time I write, I'm always putting my fears into the into the whatever I'm talking about because it's so easy because I'm afraid of everything so everything <laughs> the crap out of me, so I write stories about it and so it was always fiction and my fiction has done okay I actually I'm a bit of a pioneer in the self-publishing space because I had had a bunch of short fiction uh, published in different magazines and articles you know science fiction magazines or weird fiction magazines mm -hmm. and in 2004 I was sitting on this pile of short stories that had been published already, but the rights reverted back to me. And people would say, so you're a writer, right? Yeah, I am. Well, where can I buy your stuff? I'm like, well, you know, if you travel six hours to the, you know, Detroit, maybe on a, on a shop shelf, there's a, there's a small press magazine circulation, 100 copies. If they have any left, you might be able to buy my stuff. <laughs> <You know>. <laughs> so, <laughs> step, drive to Detroit. Second step, exactly. step to bookstore. And, and if you survive, but uh, what happens is, um, I used print on demand. I used Ingram's lightning source to um, create one hand screaming, which was a, a collection of previously published short fiction. And against the advice of, of, of good friends of mine who were successful writers. And they said, do not self publish. It's the worst thing you can do or the best thing you can do to kill your career. And when so was I, I hid the when, fact. When was that? This was, 
2004. So this is 10 oh, years yeah. before self-publishing was what the cool kids were doing. Yeah. So I created, I had a friend of mine who was a graphic designer. He did the cover for me. He did the, while well, the books, the stories were edited because I'd already sold them to a, a publisher. So they mm -hmm. already had that stamp of approval that someone else thought they were good, not just me. <laughs> right, that's right. Key. Um, and then I also, um, uh, he designed a logo and it was Stark Publishing, which now people think of Game of Thrones or they made to think of uh, Iron Man. But um, Stark was my, my best friend, Steve and I, Steve and Mark, when you combine the letters together, we had Stark. And that's that was a, a, a couple <laughs> of names we'd use when we were DJing in university. And so I said, hey, I want to use the name for Stark Publishing. So he designed me a nice logo. And I hid the fact. It was like, it was like masturbation. You wouldn't talk about... <laughs> Right. Self-published. You wouldn't say, "Hey, everyone, I masturbate tonight." It's the same thing. You say, "Hey, everyone, I self published a book." And no, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so I kept it hidden uh, until all the cool kids started doing it. Then, um, and then I realized that I had been, I'd been in in the game a long time earlier. So I'd been a hybrid author mm -hmm. ten years before hybrid was even a, a term that people would use. But you had to learn a lot through that because I remember I never used Lightning Source, but I was familiar with it. Um, I did some early. Um, self-publishing stuff on Lulu and I always looked at lightning source and it seemed like um, it seemed kind of hard to do but I guess maybe I just wasn't that familiar with the process well it was it was designed for publishers right it was meant to be uh, a tool that publishers could use so you had to know layout and publishing and Adobe and right. all the things to create a, a good print book and so mm -hmm. there was a lot of just like in in, in good self-publishing there's a lot of DIY learning Right. You have to either hire the right people for the tasks you know you're not going to be able to do well, or you, the tasks that you may be able to do well, those are things that you can do and you teach yourself. So, you know, I learned how to do some of that. I also ended up uh, through my book, uh, my book's uh, seller background in 2009, I purchased um, an espresso book machine, which uh, is a, a print on demand machine that you can print and bind a book in about 15 minutes right in the middle of the bookstore. And I learned a lot about layout because I was suddenly helping these authors design their own books and they were giving me these files and I was converting them into good print layout. And the nice thing is when you have a printer right there that can actually bind the book, best way to learn is you just throw it in the machine, see what you get, you take it back, you go back to the computer, you try it again. Right. And, and Man, so that, that was cool. It was great I, education. I remember those coming in, uh, Oh, what was it? Three or four or five years ago, maybe those things the first started hitting it uh, big and then they kind of disappeared. Do you still use them or is it is it still a viable production method? There's, when I was when I was in the game, uh, when I when I purchased the machine, we were the second one in Canada and the ninth in the world. Um, and that was 2009. Now I'm here in Portland where I am uh, this weekend. The um, uh, Powell's has one uh, just down the street. Okay. Um, there, there is about 125 in the world right now, and they are when they work, they work incredibly well. But there's a lot of MacGyvering that you have to do. <laughs> I remember things would go wrong, and it'd be a little thing because I mean it's a, it's still in very much not like a beta mode, but it's very much each machine is unique. They're not right. mass produced. They mm -hmm. are. Uh, gentle pieces of machinery and there's little tricks to, to using them. It's like the guy with the car that he's the guy who can, the only one who can get it to start. It's yeah. The same right. thing. <laughs> when we had the espresso book machine at McMaster University bookstore, you know, I would be the one who'd roll up my sleeves. I'd get on um, maybe even a web chat with one of the tech guys from on demand books and he would walk me through, you mm -hmm. know, take this Coke can and, you know, cut the <laughs> tin around here and then turn and then use this little <laughs> bit of glue and then maybe solder this piece. Then then, Oh wow. Cool. I got it to work. Um, nice. You have to be patient with, when you're a pioneer, when you're when you're using new technology, and and I know self-published authors, right? They they try different things and they experiment a lot, and that's part of it, um, and that was part of the joy. So I still believe the espresso book machines are still at the very beginning of what they will become as they continue to evolve, and they could be very much people don't give up on them. Uh, they right. could be because you know ebooks are forty years old, more than forty years old. When you actually think about ebooks, when did ebooks finally take off? Five years ago. Yeah. Right. Maybe. Right. So you gotta you gotta think about the <laughs> the espresso book machine. You know, they're they're not that old. They're ten years old. You gotta give them another yeah. ten I years remember, to mature. I remember reading a book by Donald Mass, if I'm pronouncing that right, and he talked about the ebook revolution may not happen. You know, because it was <clears throat> uh, write your uh, write the breakout novel or whatever, and to think about it 
looking back is it wasn't a sure thing because now it's a big deal. So, I mean, the espresso machines can be very similar, Yeah, you know, once it gets some traction or something. No, exactly. I mean, even like, so you had to have, you had to have Sony was the first really good ebook reader. I remember having ebook readers in the 1990s, but they were crap. Sony was the first really good one. Kindle just made it a household thing, ebooks. Right. And then when the iPad came out, that, that clinched it, right? You had, you had to have the, it's the tipping point, right? You had to have just enough uh, access to enough people to make it a big enough thing. Well, when they were new, an ebook reader, I remember when I first looked at one, they were like two or $300 or something like that. And I was like, who's going to buy that? Yeah. But, yeah and not the same now. ebooks with $35. I remember buying a Joe Hill ebook on my Sony reader, the PSR 505 or whatever it was. <laughs> and I had the hardcover in my store and it was $28. The ebook was $35. Right. And I'm thinking, yeah. but, but wouldn't it cost a little bit less? Just a little <laughs> bit less to produce this. Since there's no paper at all. <laughs> but it's still like that. I mean, you can go uh, you can go on Amazon. Like I'm a huge Brandon Sanderson fan, and I want to read the next uh, Alloy of Law book. But the ebook's eight ninety nine, and I can get yeah. the paperback for like six bucks. So it's, yeah, it's like, God. Crazy. So there's but still... There's still some learnings that publishers have to do regarding um, regarding that, and I think uh, I think that may be a publisher wanting to drive you to buy the paperback because right. that's where they've invested all their money in print distribution. Right. They yeah. want to get their sell through on the ten thousand copies they pumped out to your bookstore distributors and and right. things like that. So yeah, you have the that. fifty books for two ninety nine that were originally thirty dollars that they're selling at the front of a bookstore. Yeah, they're just trying to so. <clears throat> try, trying to keep that model going. Yeah, that's excellent. So back to your fiction. So what? Which yeah. um, are you working on anything currently, or, or where's your where are you? What is your uh, direction you're going with your fiction right now? So uh, the fiction's been more uh, experimental. So I had uh, it's interesting. A thriller came out um, like a couple years ago, Evasion, mm -hmm. which is just like a short, fast-paced thriller, which I just loved writing. You know, the whole uh, the the book takes place over the course of four hours. I had written and published the same year with a small publisher. So Evasion was self-published and the same year I, I signed a deal with a publisher uh, for the book I Death, which was just pure sh schlocky, nasty, evil adult content horror that is not safe for anywhere. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> unfortunately, the, they had really good distribution into the US, not so good at distribution into Canada. And so it sort of died a slow death. And then a small Canadian publisher, Edge Science Fiction and Fantasy, picked it up. And they're relaunching it. I'm actually doing a contest right now called um, GetKilledByMarkLeslie.com, <laughs> where you can enter to be killed in a story I'm going to write during November and publish uh, like a short story um, in uh, December. And it's a tie into this novel. Um, I Death is um, this. Uh, teenager named Peter O'Malley who has a death curse. Everyone he becomes friends with ends up dying. Some bizarre, strange death. So it's very Twilight Zone-y with Twilight Zone meets, you know, really nasty um, adult horror with lots of blood and guts. And um, I've done this before. I've actually killed people for charity where I've killed people <laughs> to raise money for it's Eerie for the Con. Greater and, good. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. for the greater good. But people would, you know, I'd have people in things auction where I'd say, well, I'll, Peter will kill you. I'll write a standalone story in this universe. And you'll become a friend of Peter's and you'll die. Uh, so <laughs> the, the winner of this contest, I will find out their greatest fears. I'll find out the things they like, the things they don't like. So I can create a character and then figure out a situation by which Peter meets this person. And of course this person dies. Nice. So um, that's I death and it's being relaunched again uh, from uh, edge publishing. And then Can a Canadian werewolf in New York, which was a book I started as a nano NaNoWriMo novel in 2006 that I finally finished about four years ago. I kept chipping at it over time. <laughs> and Did you get the 50,000 words during the NaNoWriMo? NaNoWriMo? What's How that? far did you get during the actual NaNoWriMo 2006? I think I actually, the very, the actual one, it was my first NaNoWriMo, and I, and I did about 30,000 words. Mm -hmm. And I, that was about half the book. So yeah. the book's closer to about 65, 70,000 words. And I finally found through uh, Superstars Writing Seminars, I, I was uh, recommended to an editor, and, I, and he is a good editor, and I had to wait six months uh, oh. to, to, to get him. But when I finally got him, it was weird timing. When he got the manuscript back to me, I ran out of time because I had different projects on the go. So this poor novel is still um, in the, 
in pre-order, I keep sliding it back. I know you can't do that on Amazon, but on Kobo, it's on pre-order. Uh, I can just slide it back every month. I go, oh, I'm going to need another month to get to get this. Because <laughs> it was such a good edit. There's so many good things that he's done to it. And I haven't actually finished um, the, some of the rewrite uh, pieces that I need to do to make it that much better. So, But a Canadian werewolf in New York, I will be so happy because it's been 10 bloody years since I started that book. It's almost like a <laughs> traditional cool. writer who's got the one novel that they're, you know, oh, it's, I'm still not done and it's 10 years later. Right. So it's kind of, it's funny how I can crank out, you know, two books in a year and yet have this other book that's just been with me for, for takes, that long. It takes a while. Maybe that's just its particular journey, kind of like a hero's journey, your book's got its journey. I'm, a, I'm really intrigued by the idea of waiting for six months for an editor because I've become so impatient um, now since I've started, you know, self-publishing that if I send off an email to an editor or a, a book designer, and I don't get a response in a week. I about lose my mind. <laughs> you yeah, know? I know it's, it's, it's funny when you look at it that way, because I, I, I'm older. I grew up in, um, traditional publishing. I grew up mm -hmm. where I actually would type on a typewriter mail a self-addressed stamped envelope right. and i know most people writing today will go an sase what the hell is that what is that <laughs> is that a military because thing it sounds like an acronym for an attack there was squad no internet. <laughs> it, it is they're trying to and it was out, hilarious like, some because... cool like funky words that go with that like af and you're like no it's way cooler than af it is <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny you would wait six months for the privilege of getting a rejection from from an editor <laughs> so so it's kind of, I, I kind of laugh at myself too because I have the same thing where when I email something off or whatever and I don't hear it back right away or I go oh I gotta wait 24 hours for this to publish what do you what do you mean 20 I gotta wait 24 hours I want it <laughs> now damn it uh, <laughs> we've become the button what more do you want from me <laughs> but that's an important thing I mean delayed gratification is such a uh, such an incredible character uh, right. uh, it really is is something uh, we, we, we think about with, with young people um, who, who never had to have that delayed gratification. You know, like my parents would probably say, well, we had to milk the cow first before we could drink it. And I was go, oh, we had to wait for the milk to get delivered. And then now it's like, oh my God, it's not open 24 hours. I can't just go and buy milk whenever I want. <laughs> so it's this weird sort of, this thing where no wonder they shake their heads at us, you know, the yeah. older generation when, when they see how, how uh, upset we can get just because, oh, no. I mean, I was in Lincoln City in Oregon, uh, you know, this week for the, for uh, masterclass writing uh, conference. And I went to go to buy shaving cream and a razor blade and I get to the store and it's nine Oh five and, and they roll up the sidewalks at 9 PM. Now I'm from a larger city where things are open 24 hours and you're <laughs> like, what, 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 what you, but it, but it's Thursday night. You don't you understand? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So you, you're a writer, but you're also um, the director of self-publishing at Kobo Writing Life. Author relations. And oh yeah, and uh, the head of author relations. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got hooked up with Kobo, and then uh, what your role is there? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I was uh, I was running an espresso book machine at McMaster University in Hamilton, which is you know about an hour uh, away from Toronto, where Kobo's head office is. And my authors who were coming in and wanted to, you know, print one book or print 10 copies of a book. I had an account with Kobo as a publisher and I would also, if they wanted for a small fee, because Kobo would, would do that for, for me. Uh, I would send them the, 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 the doc, the PDF for the word doc, and they would convert it into an EPUB for me. And I would allow these local self-published authors to have their books available worldwide through Kobo. So I'd had a relationship with them. And I was in conversations with them at a certain point and they were looking at creating a self-publishing platform to make it easier for, for, you know, small authors uh, or indie authors and small publishers. And if you wanted to self-publish to Kobo, you had to either provide an Onyx file, an XML based Onyx file industry standard, <laughs> use the FTP and deposit the file and deposit. And it was this, and it would take six hours to, to create an account because it was, it was, designed for larger publishers with IT uh, support. Right. And so I was hired uh, by Kobo for a couple of reasons. I've been a bookseller for 20 years. I had uh, been traditionally published. I had been self-publishing since 2004. I was familiar with both the business side of things and the creative side of things in such a way that they saw that I would be a really good advocate for authors. And uh, also without 
sparing the expense of the importance of the business aspect. So uh, I was hired to come up with a solution, uh, which became Kobo Writing Life, and we launched it in 2012. I'm actually celebrating my five-year Kobo-versary uh, this month. I was hired in October of <laughs> That's a real word. I like that, Kobo-versary. Yeah. Kobo-versary is a real <laughs> So it's, it, it's a real word. Um, and, and again, it, it's, it's been an incredible climb because Kobo Writing Life, which is basically our version, I'm sure most writers who've, who've, who've you know, done self-publishing are familiar with Kindle Direct Publishing. Right. Kobo Writing Life is kind of like Kindle Direct Publishing, but prettier. Uh, it's Canadian, so it apologizes to you all the time. And <laughs> we we represent between fifteen to twenty five percent of Kobo's overall business. So really? when you think that independent authors, uh, self published authors, really small publishers who are usually one or two or you know five person operations, are actually outselling the world's largest publishers, uh, wow. who have you know a giant buildings in New York that they own. Uh, and and endless uh, dollars, endless pockets. So that's quite right. an amazing, incredible thing, and and I really think it has it. It shows you something about the community uh, of what's possible if you give people the tools to be successful. They will use them in such creative and innovative ways that they will be successful. And 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 so you know, I like to consider that my team is an enabler of bestsellers. Uh, right. Or an enabler of a lifestyle. There are people, more and more people, who, because you know, maybe they make X amount of money on Kobo, they make X amount of money on Kindle, they make X amount of money on iBooks, and X amount of money on Nook, and maybe some people are even making money off of Google. Um, <laughs> they're Probably making money, enough yeah. money to sustain a full-time income, uh, right. which would not have been possible eight years ago. Which is, I mean, unless you went through traditional publishing, in which case, then you got to wait a year. To get your once a year royalty check, right? And, or yeah. you get a really good advance, uh, which doesn't really happen unless your last name Sanderson, your first name is Brandon. Yeah, like you know that kind of thing. <laughs> well, well, and, and, and to be to honest, that that's a much slower process, and that only a very small percentage actually make a full time living back in the old days of 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 so of traditional publishing. I guess. Yeah. Um, is yeah, what it seems. True. Oh. And that's true. And what you see now more is more and more. Um, you well for for myself, I make half of my income from self publishing, and the other half from traditional. If I had only done one, I would be making half the money. Some yeah. years, and 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 I'll be honest, like my print book revenue is ninety ninety five percent traditional, and my ebook revenue is ninety ninety five percent self publishing. Because <laughs> hey, my publisher has no clue how to sell an ebook. But boy, do they ever sell print books well because yeah, they get right. my books into Costco. Uh, my last book, Creepy Capital, was in Walmart as well, as well as all the bookstores. Mm -hmm. So distribution in the print world was absolutely phenomenal. And that's why when people ask, he said, well, you can make more if you self-publish. I said, yeah, but I would never be able to get my books into Costco. Right. And you have no right. idea what that is like. Um, I, I mean, I, again, it's that old, wow, I've been, somebody granted me the status of they wanted to publish my book. And and I know that's a dream that a lot of writers have. Right. But walking into a Costco and seeing a skit of your books beside a skit of Stephen King's books, oh, my that's God. kind of a cool thing. It, it's a complete <laughs> yeah. nerd nerd factor. Yeah. But uh, it, that's a cool thing. So, that But is. I realized that if I hadn't been open to both sides, I, I would be making half as much as I am today. Do you see carryover from your uh, indie published stuff to your traditional published stuff and then vice versa? Oh, yeah. For sure. And that's why it's kind of funny. So Dundurn, my publisher, knows what I do. I, I enable <laughs> authors to not have to go through a publisher. Right. Um, <laughs> but they also know that every time I push uh, one of my fiction titles, that may lead someone to nonfiction. And my nonfiction titles really does lead people to my fiction. It's such an incredible thing. Um, I get... I've been a writer for a long, long time, but I only started um, nonfiction in 2012. And I've been on television, and I've been on, you know, across uh, across the U.S., across Canada, radio programs. Usually, it's from midnight till three in the morning, where they want right. some, they want to keep the truck drivers awake, right? And Which they is want important. to, <laughs> and 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 it's the call-in radio shows and the paranormal stuff, and it is amazing. But it's it's amazing to see because I I can't see. I get once a year, I get a, a royalty statement from my publisher. But when I'm on the radio program talking about my new nonfiction ghost story paranormal, I see an uptake on my digital sales. 
in the next, you know, 24, 48 hours, right. I see, wow, people were listening to the radio program. Suddenly, for some <laughs> strange reason, my book started to sell in all over the U.S. Like, I wonder where that, I wonder yeah, where that came right. from. Well, you, obviously, you intrigued some, some truck drivers at 3 a.m. and they yeah. checked, checked <laughs> it out. And so, do you do any audiobook stuff? Do you have any yourself well, available in audiobooks? Yeah, I started. So here's the, 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 the clincher for Canadians is Canadians can't use ACX, which is probably good because then we don't get locked in for seven years. Right. But um, I um, my day job with Kobo, I was at Book Expo America a couple of years ago, and I met a gentleman from Listen Up Audiobooks, and they were looking to um, see if we could collaborate on something. So we actually came up with – uh, no, no, doing your own audiobooks is about four hundred and fifty dollars an hour. That's pretty standard, right? Mm -hmm. And we have a deal for a couple of writing life authors who want to, because because Canadians can't use <laughs> ACX, yeah, yes, which I think is so um, strange. But we'll go on with your odd. Um, but they, it's a hundred dollars off an hour if you're a Cobra writing life author. So you can do an audiobook for 350. So I took evasion, which was a, you know, it's only about a 50,000 word thriller. And I had that converted into an audiobook. and I was the Guinea pig. So I paid out of my own pocket as an author. And I went through the process because before we ever partner with anyone, I'm really, really cautious. I want to make sure that an author who comes to Kobo or uses Kobo writing life, um, is not taken advantage of is given opportunity and is not ripped off. There's there's a lot of rip off artists out there. Oh yeah. But I wanted to make sure that this company was on the up and up and that the process was good for an author. And that's one of the, the joys about being an author and running this program is I'll say, well, here I'll test it myself and I'll see what I like and what I don't like about it. And I went through the whole process and I was really satisfied with it. And now of course I, I realize, wow, if I've got all these truck drivers listening to these shows that I'm on in the middle of the night, all my books should be in audio so they can listen to my books while they're driving. Uh, so, um, but, but, so listen up, um, if you're a Cobra Writing Life author, you can use their tool. And the great thing about it is they give you the files when you're done. So you own all the rights of, oh, very cool. of that. you paid for it. So it's yours. They just give right. it to you. So then you can upload it wherever you want. They also do have a distribution option, which is sort of secondary. Here's the thing. Make your file professionally. They have actors, uh, the guy who did my voice, um, it was so cool to see that he's, he's a character actor. He's been on a bunch of different television programs and movies and stuff like yeah. that. So it's kind of fun to have that. And then um, I had the option of just taking my files and loading them myself. Um, but because, again, as a Canadian, I don't have access directly to certain uh, tools, I just said, you know, you distribute for me. And then they, they sent me, I got my first royalty uh, statement, uh, I think three months ago. And I was like, hey, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And they distribute to Audible and iTunes and Overdrive, which which is also owned by Rakuten, which owns Kobo uh, right. for the library market. So that was, that was great to see uh, that um, because audiobooks are, you know, are, are obviously going to be uh, growing. Um, Scott and I are huge audiobook junkies. If I mean, if we read anything, we're listening to it for sure. That uh, I think I've shared uh some of his uh some audiobooks to him and he shared some to me and then uh that because I, I like it because i like when i drive to work i have a 30 minute commute so i listen to 30 minutes in the car and then 30 minutes home and when i'm doing 30 minutes is, you lucky guy i have like an hour and a half <laughs> oh man yeah you for me 30 minutes, 30 minutes is long actually an hour and a half commute might be better because then i could listen to more books that's true. Oh yeah, that's that's it is way better. No, but uh, thank God for our audiobooks and podcasts because they keep me sane. Uh, I've already pulled out all my hair, so there's nothing left. <laughs> audiobooks greatly reduce road rage and other things. They uh, do actually. So they really do. So you mentioned they are uh, going to keep our society. They're going to keep our society on track. It's audiobooks us, will be just saving yeah, holding us together. Yes. <laughs> Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, being a part of Kobo Writing Life, you get uh, certain tools and different things. Uh, I have the book that I have on Kobo right now, which is the first one of my series. I've actually done through Draft to Digital as an aggregate, um, but I understand that there's a difference in going through an aggregate to doing directly through Kobo Writing Life. Is that true or? A little bit. Uh, I think uh, of any of the third-party aggregators, uh, Draft Digital is probably by far the, the, the most slick, the mm. most beautiful, almost as beautiful as, as our platform directly. Um, they also allow you, and this is key, especially if you want to break outside of the U.S. market, is they allow you to set your pricing in more than U.S. dollars, and that's critical, and I think authors should all take advantage of that. Cobra Writing Life does that as well. We just recently expanded from eight uh, currencies to 14 currencies because you know, 50% of authors 
uh, titles are selling in Canada. And if you don't have an attractive Canadian price as opposed to, you know, your book is four ninety nine US, but it's, you know, six twenty one Canadian. Yeah, it's some weird thing. And I haven't right. quite figured that out. But I remember um, at a conference, they talked a great deal that that is something that, that might have been your presentation. You're talking about the benefits of having the price um, specific to the market and that people appreciate sure. that. For sure, that's a it's a it's a subtle thing, but it really makes a difference, especially because Kobo, and I think uh, iBooks and Nook are more like uh, more like Kobo in that way, and and that our websites are curated like a bookstore. We have mm -hmm. merchandisers who put things in the front window. Amazon, uh, the inmates run the asylum, right? Like you just <laughs> right keyword gaming and all kinds of stuff and algorithms and tricking the system to rank this and rank that. Well, we have algorithms and ranking, but a lot of our a lot of our stores are, are, are carefully placed items based on a merchandiser sees the book goes, oh, that's awesome. Oh, the price is also awesome. <laughs> it sticks it in the, in the yeah. window. Um, so that, that's where it becomes important. Uh, and we also have built in a promotions tool, which is currently in beta. So um, you have to request it. And uh, we actually take a quick look at your books. And the reason it's in beta is we're still ironing out the, the, the formatting for it. But we take a look at your books. And if your books are... Um, uh, not quite ready for prime time, like you know, you you did the cover yourself using paint. Um, <laughs> we usually come up with a polite excuse and say, "I'm sorry, it's in beta right now." <laughs> but uh, if sorry. we look at your books and go, "Oh, that looks like a book we would likely include," like it looks professional, it looks like the the author did the time, put the time into making this the best book they could. We enable the promotions tab that allows you the opportunity to. Submit for consideration to we have monthly 30% off promos. We have um, fe Featured free titles. So a free first in series um, And then we either charge you a small amount of money for that spot or we charge you cost of goods So we charge you only if you actually sell which is like, I kind of prefer that as an author because it means I don't pay anything up front right. um, So instead of paying you 70% every time it's sold through that promo we only pay you 60% and so that way you only pay if you sell as opposed right. to you drop a bunch of money and you pray you know pr hope to god that that book the book about money i spent in i get my money back um so and again that's why it's still in beta because there's still some uh enhancements to it the filtering for when you're looking for a good promo for yourself because sometimes there's so many promos you can't <clears throat> figure out what's good for you what's not <clears throat> and then the other thing too is giving you the choice do you want to pay a flat fee because you're confident you're going to make right the money back or if you're not as confident then maybe that cogs the cost of good shaving is probably a safer alternative for you. <laughs> and so those are just the, some of the things we built in directly. Oh, sorry? No, I was just going to say on your promo stuff, you can promo on Amazon, but it doesn't really give you a good uh, view and a good um, experience. Uh, in my. I've done it once, and you pay the whatever it is per clicks, and you don't really see where that comes from. And, and if you get sales, I mean, you do, but... Yeah. Is it's not very interactive or, or versatile for a, a self publisher. Is is that something that you guys are including in your promo works or how? So that's part of the beta. So right now uh, we tell you where the promo is going to run. We tell you what what regions it's being run in, like U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Um, it's mostly English language, Great Britain. So it's only it's going to be in either all. It's going to be worldwide or it's going to be in one of those five areas. Right. So for example, if we're featuring romance in the in the U.K. only. It's not going to be naked, you know, guys with cut abs and sexy firefighters and stuff like that on the covers because in the UK, that Scott doesn't loves sell. Those. That sells in the yeah. Scott yeah. loves those in the US. But in, in, <laughs> but in the, the UK, UK, it's more traditional with the big fancy dresses and the, and the eloquent stuff and not the, not the half-naked people. So right. th th there are a lot of distinctions, even in English language territories. Like, the, you know, if, if, there's, if there's no donut or a hockey puck on the cover, the, the romance book will not sell in Canada. That's kind of how it works. <laughs> <laughs> but there are those subtles. Uh, the, the donut <laughs> hockey puck romance. Yeah, that's book right. It, believe it or not, we actually are featuring right now for the month of October because hockey season, that's, that's the uh, sport, by the way. Oh, yeah. No baseball, no football. It's all hockey. The um, the romance from the um, uh, hockey romance, and and there's a full page feature that we've been featuring for the month of October. Ironically, inspired by independent authors I met at, at Romance Writers of America this summer, they approached me. Uh, one one author approached me and said, "Listen, I have three or four friends. We've all written hockey romance. You're from Canada. We should talk." So they brought it to me. 
I went back to, I have a team of, of 10 people on the business side. And Shana, who's also a writer, uh, is, is, works with the merchandising team. Her job is looking for neat promos that indie authors can be part of, even outside of the promo tab. So it's, promo tab's a big part of it. But there's other things where we say, okay, we got these six titles that we think are pretty awesome. What are we going to do with them? We could just feature those six, or we could see if there's something bigger. So we went to the merchandising team, the Canadian merchandisers, and said, we got this. We think we should do something really big, you know, to, to, as hockey season comes. Because the Americans, they have, they have Thanksgiving a month later. That's a big deal. We don't have, you know, we have our hockey season. That's our thing. And we ended up doing, uh, instead of just these six or seven titles, it's a full-page feature, including titles from a couple larger publishers and a couple smaller publishers. So suddenly, instead of it being six authors, you know, driving a bunch of people to a landing page so that they can you know, cross promote, you're suddenly getting the power of all these different publishers and all these different authors all driving more people. So not only is Kobo featuring it on a landing page, but people are driving people to that landing page because they say, hey, to my newsletter, you like hockey romance, I write hockey romance, I'm part of this great promo, click here mm -hmm. and you can read not only my books, but a whole bunch of other ones. Um, right. And, and that, that's, that's one of those things that I get really excited about because it's one of those things that some really ingenious indie authors came, approached us with the idea. We didn't just stick their book up for a week somewhere right. saying, oh, we'll see if it sells. We actually tried to make something bigger. So we're, we're always looking for thematic things that can be beyond just that one thing that you wanted to do. Maybe there's 10, maybe, maybe 10 authors can benefit from it at the same time. Those are the things that excite us right. um, on the Cobra Writing Life team on our side. We, we, get, we get eager, we're, we're, we're watching, we're tracking to see what does well, how did it work, what did we do wrong, what could we do better next time. So um, it's not just fun, but there's, there's the, the analytics behind it too. Right. I remember that, that really struck me when I heard, you, I heard you speak in person one time and you had said a little bit about when one of your authors like strikes it big that everybody's really excited for him. And I was like, you know, there's actually people behind this, this publishing company and, and, they, and it makes sense. Everybody wins. So I, that was pretty cool. I like that. And I like all the work that you're doing at Kobo. Oh, thank you. That, it it really cool. is. It, it makes a difference if we can see someone. So, for example, somebody that I think I met through the Superstars Writing Seminars. I think that's where you and I met, Scott, wasn't it? Oh, it was a Smart Artist. Down there. Smarter Artist. Oh, we met at Smarter Artist. Not the, very similar, similar uh, right. mode. But um, I saw him at a conference just this week, and I remember meeting him four years ago. And I remember when you know he was selling one book a month on Kobo. And, 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 and I just kept saying, you know what, you've got good stuff. Just keep trying, just keep at it. It takes a long time. And this week he's selling hundreds of dollars worth of books a month just on Kobo. And mm -hmm. again, he's grown on all the platforms over time and, and come from just starting out and just, just selling one book here, one book there. And now I see that as like, wow, cool. That's so awesome. Look at you. You're like poster child for <laughs> keep at it, right? right? Do something you believe in. Keep at it. Keep working hard. And and yeah, it's not easy. There's no one trick. Uh, there's no one trick bullet anymore. Uh, right. And if there is, it's going to get so exploited that it'll only last for a couple months, and then <clears throat> and then you're off to the next one trick. Um, that consistency. It's I love to see that paying off for an author. I uh, I like that. Um... Uh, I have one book that's wide and uh, the second book in that series is on KDP right now. Um, but I like that f in Kobo writing life, you and Kobo in general, it seems like the people that are behind that are actively interested and invested in having the author succeed rather than having the author pull a bunch of business into their store so they can make a lot of money. That's interesting to me. Yeah, we only make money if you make money, basically. Right. Um, you know, we get to keep 30%, or if you're pricing below $2.99, then we keep a lot more. But mm -hmm. um, that's, an, that's an important aspect for us because – we're only successful if you guys are successful, and it's 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 actually it's a like a, a, a symbiotic relationship where we need we need each other, right? right. We need good content for our readers because all we do, right? Remember, is only it's only about reading. It's only about eBooks. That's it. Right. We don't sell cars or gadgets or. 
You're not yeah, selling blenders so, and lawnmowers and weight loss products and all that stuff that other yeah. that the world's largest river company. Uh, exactly. Sells. So we need we need good books. So we need authors. We need you guys to be writing books and publishing them to our platform because our readers need them. And then I, ideally, we hopefully give you a decent enough service that you keep publishing your books to Kobo so you can continue to make money and we can make money and we can all uh, survive uh, till the next day. That's that's really what it's all about. I see that uh, I'm, I'm on your site now and it, you've got, uh, like you said, it's a very streamlined very nice looking setup where it's not a whole bunch of uh it's not very busy you can go and you can look at the books and and search what you want and there's not a whole lot of distraction going on which i really like um i see that you also sell e-readers and obviously you've got an app to read um there was a big i don't want to say crash over the last couple of years where barnes and noble kind of went into the tanks and they still have their their uh, physical stores here and there, but their e-reader, as far as everybody's uh, been mentioning, uh, is not widely successful. Do you see your product as um, being successful and continuing to be successful compared to you know just the Kindle where the Nook wasn't? For sure, uh, and ironically, I mean, here's the here's the crazy thing: is we continue. We started off not wanting to produce e-readers. We produced free apps for every platform. We said, you already have a smartphone. We have free apps. Why do you want to carry another device around? It was our customers that demanded we started making dedicated e-readers. And uh, the dedicated e-readers we've, we've um, put out, we've actually put out a premium. The Kobo Aura 1 is a premium, really expensive e-reader, waterproof. It also has a built-in light sensor that, depending on the time of day, the actual light changes the filtration so that there's there's uh, scientific studies that show when you're reading, even on that nice, it's not backlit like a computer screen, even on an e-ink device that has a built-in light, the, the color of the light affects your brain waves in such a way that it doesn't allow you to put put yourself to sleep. Right. right. Yeah. And our new Kobo Aura 1, like all our devices have beautiful lights. I, I can read while my partner's uh, sleeping. I could read, put it at 10%, and it's enough light for me to read without disturbing her. So mm -hmm. what happens is with this new device, uh, after a certain time of day, it starts to change the filtration on the light so that it actually allows your brain to relax and sleep better. Right. So oh, that's very cool. <clears throat> but again, the devices are so successful. And this was designed, when we designed this, we actually brought in a panel of 12 of our best customers from the Toronto area, which is where our head office is. And we spent six months with them. And we would give them prototypes and say, well, what do you like about this? What do you not like about it? It's a much larger device. It's the exact same size as a standard uh, trade paperback. So it's a little bit wider, which means for those avid readers, there's less page turns at, at the typical font size. You could change the font size to whatever you want, but you can keep a larger right. font size. And it's not as many, cause again, just tapping the screen or swiping the screen, that's extra motion you shouldn't have to do. So you're getting an extra four or five lines of text per right. page. Um, and then it's um, it's a nice flush waterproof device um, up to an hour at two meters deep. So wow. even if you drop it and it takes you a while to retrieve it, you can still um, pull it out. What but again, the, the readers are just, again? Sorry, what's that? What was the name of that Kobo device? Oh, the Kobo Aura 1. <clears throat> and it was, again, when we released the Kobo uh, Aura H2O and the Kobo Aura originally a few years ago, it was such an expensive device that we thought only the really dedica dedicated, diehard book nerds, our best customers of all, people who read two books a day, they're the only ones who are, are going to want this. The mass majority are going to want to buy a $99 e-reader. Um, and with Kobo Aura 1, we got such great reviews in Wired and a whole bunch of other magazines um, that we ended up selling out everywhere. Uh, we ran out of stock. We ran out of supply. We, we were panicked that we weren't going to get more, <laughs> more than back in the market. Fortunately, they are back in the market. But again, it was it was a really fascinating thing. But again, that's evidence that um, it's not even the cost of the thing. It's, it's somebody gets a good device, right. they stick with it. And I, I've been an ebook reader since the Sony days. So that's when I started reading regularly. And I did the paper-free diet. And I tried that out for 10 days and went, well, look at this. I can do it. I, I do read paper as well. 
Um, mm -hmm. I, so audio, paper, ebook, I read pretty much every platform. Sure. But it's interesting. I, I, I see that market is continuing to grow. And our app market is continuing to grow too. Um, so that's kind of, we're seeing growth uh, across the board, which which is amazing. Now, the growth is not the same growth we saw four years ago. We're not getting like 600% growth year over year. Yeah. But we're still getting double digit growth. And the funny thing is, is when you listen to certain people in the industry, like from traditional publishing, their sales are not growing as much. They're still growing, but they're not growing as much. Right. So yeah, of course you compare the boom of anything to a steady, slow, uh, increasing business, and and mm -hmm. people are going to say the the end is nigh. Ebooks are dead. No one's buying ebooks anymore. That is not the case. Yeah. Well, I can't speak for any other ebook company out there, but that is not the case. Ebooks are alive and well, and then ebook readers are continuing to grow, and particularly as we're in a lot of foreign markets, the growth is phenomenal. Uh, yeah. In the Netherlands, for example, where we're partnered with Bol, which is a giant, uh, a giant online uh, retailer, it's an amazing experience for us. We're growing significantly in France and Italy. We're growing significantly in so many other markets that it's just amazing uh, when I see someone go, "All oh, ebooks are dead." Uh, I, I just I kind of giggle and go, "All right, that's short sighted of you." <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you got to play the long game and you have to be dedicated. You know, people want to turn a quick buck and get in and out of the business. That's fine. But, uh, you know, I think that ebooks are obviously here to stay for a long time. And yeah, for uh, sure. Probably audiobooks coming along right, are going to make a, a, a push to closer yeah. to the front. I don't think that would be quite as popular because some people just can't stand to listen to somebody else read. Like That's my, true. Some, my sister hates them, but I just can't live without them. I literally. I've had some severe mental breakdowns when I, I dropped a, my uh, MP3 player in a can of paint one time. Oh, and no. The first thing my wife said is just go buy another one. I can't just get <laughs> one. <man. laughs> I can't take you without an ebook. And so I went and uh, I bought a new one, which at the time was very extravagant for me to just go buy a new MP3 yeah. player right at that time. But think about it. The three of us, right? The three of us here. How many times do you actually get three people together that all listen to audiobooks? Uh, right. Maybe a year ago, two years ago, maybe one of us mm -hmm. would have been an advocate for audio, and the other two go, oh, "I just can't stand it." Yeah, yeah. Um, it's 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 growing. It's still it's still a, a growing uh, market, and again, it's about consuming books <clears throat> mm -hmm. in a different fashion. And it is digital consumption of books when you think about it, oh, yeah. because I'm not listening to an audiobook on on vinyl. It's so much safer to listen. <laughs> Although to, that yeah. would be cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot safer to listen to an audio book than read one while you're driving too. So. Uh, apparently. Although that was cute. There was a there was a, <laughs> a, a bus driver in Vancouver. There, someone took a picture of him. He was reading on his Kobo. Well, it, someone took a picture. He had the Kobo under the steering wheel and he was reading. <laughs> nice. They're like, well, this is kind of good, but it's not good. Is this good publicity? Is this bad publicity? Yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of cute to see that. Do you see uh, Kobo ever venturing into the audiobook market, like producing them? Uh, I think, you know, think that Kobo has always been about reading and Kobo has been about consuming books and it's always been about that experience. So if if the market shows that reading is going to happen in different formats, we're probably going to be interested in that. Very cool. Awesome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, we're coming up on the hour, which is uh, always the downfall of the show because we usually we love these conversations and uh, we could probably talk for days and days about books, which Scott and I do. Um, is there are there any last thoughts of uh, on Kobo writing life that you'd like to share with authors? Maybe somebody that's uh, just coming into the the industry that has questions about whether to go with KDP or whether to go with Kobo writing life. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm obviously going to be a, an advocate for. I'm not going to be an advocate for select um, uh, right. and going exclusive to the enemy. Um, I'm probably going to be a little bit more uh, give give wide a try. But I also want to remind people that we don't penalize authors who want to price beyond $9.99. Uh, and, and again, oh, for, for okay. a single book, that's probably not a good idea. But if you're putting together a box set and your books are, let's say, $4 each and you have five books that you want to put together, you know that would be $20 <laughs> if they bought them individually. So giving the, the, the reader a good deal would maybe be $14.99, which is kind of like 30 or 40% cheaper to yeah. encourage them to buy the box set. But we don't penalize you and give you the, the lower uh, discount. The, you know, Amazon will give you 35%. Right. We give you the full 70 no matter where you price. So it doesn't hurt you 
to uh, try those things out because we've actually had some huge successes because our customers are not the bargain basement bin shoppers mm -hmm. who they don't just shop the bargain bin at the front of the store. They walk into the depths of the store and what they're really looking for is a good read. Right. And they're will really willing to pay a reasonable price for a good read. So uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that I have is a lot of indie authors use the low price point as a funnel to get in, but mm -hmm. then they condition their readers to only buy cheap stuff. And right. that, for some people, that cheapens the value because there will be some readers who would probably have loved your stuff, but they got bit because they went and bought a 99 cent novel that was not good. Yeah. And they're, they're leery about going back to that because they go, oh, God, I just needed to be edited. for You know, it was a good yeah. book, but I just couldn't get past all of the typos and, and, and grammar problems with it or whatever. Right. So that, that, that's a challenge. I think that's a challenge that uh, we indies have to face head on. Do you Absolutely. think that that's a, uh, a product of, like, indies having a lack of self-esteem, like they just think they can't compete unless they go super cheap? Or is it, or is it because they're trying to follow whatever marketing guru five years ago said it was a good idea? Yeah, I think it's a combination of following the marketing. Like you know, John Locke was the one who first did the ninety-nine right. cent novel and made a hundred thousand. Then we then we learned even after we learned he was a liar and scammer, um, <laughs> we still follow that. He's like, but wait a second, but it, you can't do it if you don't lie and scam. No, I'm kidding. But but that's the thing. But then there's also self-esteem. Right. Uh, writers, we, we have such fragile egos. But the reality is, I, I, I look at it from this perspective, you know, you're going to pay X amount of dollars to see a movie for two hours. This right. book is going to entertain me for four to eight hours. Right. You know, what am I willing, what am I reasonably willing to pay to be entertained? And $5 is not an unreasonable price no. to pay for, for yeah. that much amazing entertainment or more. It depends, right? There are some right. authors that I would actually spend $35 on their next book because I like their stuff that much. Right, but um, but um, thank God I don't have to, yeah. because I typically uh, I typically don't uh, spend crazy amounts of money on on really expensive books. You can um, do a lot of reading for thirty five bucks. I know that's the that's the joy. So there's this weird balance, right? And that's why I, I like to show uh, when I do presentations, I like to show graphs that show what will the market bear, mm -hmm. and you see that. Um, the percentage of Cobra Writing Life sales compared to traditionally published titles, you can see what the market will bear. And in certain categories, the market will bear a little bit higher price points. In certain categories, the market will bear a little bit lower. Um, and then the NA is complicated because, but then we're just looking at generic worldwide sales. What if we break it down just to US or just to, I'll give you an example, India. If you need, if you want to sell anything in India, you got to go at 49.99 rupees or 99.99 rupees. You've got to be bargain basement cheap. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they're just going to pirate your stuff. So, right. <laughs> so yeah. there's, there's, it's not always about like Kobo. You know, is always about well, round your price up in Canada because we're used to getting ripped off. Our paperbacks, you know, your paperbacks <laughs> in the U.S. are 8.99. Ours are 12.99. So that Brandon Sanderson paperback is actually a good price in ebook for us. Yeah. <laughs> So well, he screwed me it's, on the audiobooks now. because I listened to the the Final Empire in audiobook, and then I had to go and buy Well of Ascension and Hero of Ages in audiobook, and I spent like fifty dollars on. Both there you books. go. <laughs> he got his money out of me anyway. <laughs> uh, so, where can uh, readers find out about your work, and what's the easiest way to get in touch with you? Reference uh, Cobra Writing Life. So I'm at marklesley.ca uh, or at Mark Leslie on Twitter. Uh, and Kobo Writing Life, the best way to check us out is to go to kobowritinglife.com. That's where we have a blog and a podcast uh, where we talk about the craft and business of writing. From there, you can click on a, uh, there's a, a thing on the uh, right-hand side. You can click on to log into your dashboard if you're already a member. Um, <laughs> or if you haven't signed up, you can check it out and see, see if you're interested in... Uh, publishing to Kobo's 190 countries. Very cool. I'm excited well, to use the Kobo's writing life. I've used draft to digital before, but I, I really want to try to do the Kobo stuff just through the writing life. It, it, it looks like a good, a good program. And it's worth trying both just to see what, what works best for you as an author. Yeah. Excellent. Very looks cool. good. Well, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really <coughs> appreciate you taking your time and hanging out with us for an hour. It was uh, educational and very entertaining. Uh, Thank thanks, you. guys. It's been uh, it's been a pleasure. If you want to hang for a couple of minutes after after we go off live, then we usually have kind of a post show and whatnot, which is always fun. <laughs>
<laughs> we need to videotape those for posterity. Yeah, you know, that prob <laughs> probably not. Maybe not. So much. All right, thanks guys for watching here on the live feed. If you're uh, listening on the iTunes feed, go ahead and give us a uh, rate and review if you would please. That mean a lot to us. If you're watching on YouTube, give us a subscribe on our YouTube channel. And we're not going to be live next week for Halloween. We may or may not have a show, depending on uh, if our schedules work out or not. Um, so until the next time, see you guys later, and uh, have a good day. Take care.